This is urgent. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, it's Vanguard's urgent warning to all investors as the market approaches a danger zone. I'll show you what the big money manager says is the biggest risk to markets today, and if this zone is hit, just how devastating and damaging it will be to the U.S. economy. But Vanguard's not the only one warning that the economy is in trouble. A specific sector of the U.S. economy is indicating that stocks could come crashing down. We'll show you what this sector is and just how far it indicates that stocks could drop. Now, let's head over to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up. Well, the headline is Vanguard warns that 10 year Treasury yields risk a jump back to 5%, and this could set off a disorderly sell off in a big way. And this would be very damaging for the markets right now because we know that not only do consumers and businesses desperately need interest rates to come down, the federal government is facing massive deficits and they would love to see rates fall here in a meaningful way because if they don't well it suggests that things could get very restrictive very quickly and that could lead to an all-out crash and we're in the danger zone right now this from the head of international rates at vanguard even a small move higher past the critical 4.75 percent level this on the 10-year treasury could force investors to abandon their bets on a rally giving way to a wave of selling that could push yields toward the highs of 2007. now if you can imagine how damaging that would be to the economy right now we're already seeing retailers start to hurt we're hearing from the national federation of Indian independent businesses that they can't raise prices that sales are starting to decline we're seeing companies announce more and more layoffs and it's all because we're seeing that consumers do not have access to credit and businesses don't have access to credit and in a debt-based economy well that never signals that something good is coming and many people are being forced to sell off their holdings to limit losses. And this from, again, the head of rates. We still think that there's a residual long position left over. And if that doesn't manage to be orderly squared away, that could disorderly move what could take us eventually to 5%. As Vanguard suggests, the U.S. bond market could see a massive flood of selling here. But is that likely? Well, we're going to make the case that perhaps maybe it isn't likely to happen because there is a specific buyer here that desperately will need to step in and buy every dip in rates. And the route was compounded over last week after the data showed inflation remains persistently high. And that's kind of the belief here is that for some reason, the bond market is responsive to inflation. Yet I'll show you there's almost no correlation between the two at all. The 10-year yield jumped nearly 4.7% on Tuesday before pulling back to 4.57 on Thursday as traders betting that the Fed will start cutting rates in September much later than expectations for June just a month ago. And what we're seeing here is a change in investors' view of the market. In the past, well, what we noted is that rates tend to lead the consumer price index. Today, investors really buy into the Fed's mantra and are literally responding to it. And here you can see looking back into the 1990s, what happened? 10 year treasury yields started to fall ahead of inflation. You see that here again around 1995. Rates started to fall, inflation came down. Again around 1997, rates were pretty much on par with a decline in the consumer price index. And notably, you know, the idea here is that the consumer price index needs to fall ahead of rates. But what I want you to see is that is not true historically at all. In fact, around 2000, rates started coming down and the consumer price index, well, it flatlined and even showed some signs that it was going to pop back up. And how about going into the global financial crisis? Well, rates came down briefly, rallied up a little bit, even as inflation surged. How about around 2011? Rates led, of course, consumer prices down as they did in 2014, as they did just around 2018. But look at now, you see a whole different view of the market saying that rates, all that matter is the consumer price index, when indeed that isn't the case at all. And that's putting the US economy at a big risk point that could lead to an actual outright crash in our economy without access, of course, to credit. That means consumers aren't gonna spend as much, businesses are gonna to have to lay off, and we're gonna see demand destruction in a huge way. 
And the high yields are beginning to attract some opportunistic buyers, even as negative sentiment remains firmly entrenched throughout the Treasury market. The latest client survey from JP Morgan showed that investors were net long by Treasuries the most since March of 2025. And if you're looking for an opportunity in the markets, well, we're going to give them to you in a big way. As many of you know, we have two subscriptions. One is our CTA Timer Pro. Now, we teach you to trade with the machines. This is a big deal because people say, look, how do I know to get out around the top? Well, our report shows you when the machines start to unwind in a big way, it's time to raise your stop losses, time to take some profits, time to take some positions off the table. And what's wonderful here, as we see this sell-off, we're going to be providing a massive number of signals to our subscribers, showing them how to buy the next big dip and make money, put money in their pocket. And it's not just that, we also have a report that looks at technical analysis. This is called Momentum Timer Pro, and you can see all these sell signals building up and what this means is opportunity again we're showing you how to protect your money by taking some of your profits raising your stop loss level taking money off the table and raising cash for the next opportunity in fact today i put out a subscriber only video to if you're a subscriber to either report you get this video it's very important we're talking about some macro things this is not going to be covered in the show and what do you get you get two reports you sign up for each of them you get a daily report we show you signals we put a video out on how to trade them, what my opinion is, stop loss levels, breakout levels, everything you need to know to be a successful trader. And it's really simple. Most of our subscribers, they just tell me, Steve, I put the trades in, I put my stop loss. If I get stopped out, I go to the next one. And if it rallies, I buy more. It's so easy and you can make money too. Link in description for a 30 day free trial. My buddies only give you seven. How can you make money at that? In 30 days, odds are you'll pay for your whole year subscription. And now we look toward, of course, the Richmond Fed's bark and sees a healthy but not overheated demand. And this is a challenge here because the Fed is actually causing the problem here. And I want you to understand that Vanguard suggesting that rates could go up simply because, well, investors are going to sell bonds. But what they don't understand is there's someone who desperately needs to buy them in a big way. Now, I would meant earlier when I said every dip, I meant every increase in yields needs to get bought. The question is by who? Well, it's the commercial banks. Because what's important to understand about the banking system is when they get a deposit, they have to back it with an asset. Now, ideally, they're lending and they're backing that deposit by, of course, a loan. But what happens if your loan book is in contraction and heading far south? Well, you have to back it with something, and that usually is U.S. Treasury Securities. And here you can see commercial industrial lending at all commercial banks in blue. This is the weekly data shown on a year-over-year -year rate of change against 10-year Treasury yields. And what's really important to understand in a debt-based economy is that if you see demand come down as rates go higher, that eventually that means rates need to come down substantially. Because if the market keeps pushing rates higher and higher, what it means is we're going to face even a larger amount of demand destruction, ultimately not just a mild recession that some people have forecasted, but a deep protracted recession that could lead to an all-out financial crisis, and that would cause rates to come plunging down. And you can see that evidence on this chart here. As you see, decelerations in commercial industrial lending are led by a decline in rates. And it makes sense because when you get rates high enough where they're restrictive, lending demand comes down. And again, in a debt-based economy, the more money that gets borrowed, the more growth that is seen. And you need money to be borrowed to not only fund the growth of the economy, but to pay on the existing debt. And those are two critical tenants here. And you can really see that again, every instant that rates are saying, look, we get to a restrictive level. Now going into the global financial crisis, we saw some lending, but overall that came plunging down. And again, the rates market said, hey, you're actually too restrictive here. But what's notable right now is that investors believe that rates need to go sky high and we're seeing lending in a contraction, meaning the loan books being paid down, money being destroyed and the banks are in a position to back the assets they do have well with treasury securities and that's why every dip in bond prices every backup in yields you see you get bought who's that big unbuyer well it's the banks and I think that's what, of course, the Treasury or the Vanguard is missing out on here. And as is the Fed, because we're in a situation today where demand is robust by seeing no signs yet that it's overheating. 
and overheating would lead to pressure on wages and that would lead to pressure on prices such as things were escalating and you can't find that in the wage numbers or even in the three month price numbers. So we look to the Fed now who continues to think that rates need to be higher and yet the evidence suggests that they are putting the economy in a very restrictive stance and at some point we're going to see this whole thing come grinding to a halt which I think could be in the next two to three months. And the Fed goes on, at least Barkin says, that the Fed has no need to adopt a hiking bias. Well, things are restrictive enough without these signs of a durable trend towards overheating. And the reality is we're gonna be seeing cuts sooner than later. And the evidence suggests looking at the consumer price index against average hourly earnings of production and non-supervisory employees, that's shown in red. What you can see is we saw looking at the beige book. Now, you remember this from the show the other day. The beige book said that average weekly hours are coming back to their long-term average, meaning that red line's about to come plunging down. And why would that make sense? Is because companies cannot pass on higher prices. That means they don't have the margin to give out big wages, and there's no signs we're going to see price pressure, at least from a wage perspective. And it's very clear to me as I talk around the economy, there are significant sectors where financial conditions are tight. Well, we'll show you that. It's a banking sector. But I also think it's fair to say the level of restrictiveness is something you take at some faith. I do like to look at real tip yields and give me some sense, but you're comparing to a hypothetical or hypo not hypothetical an estimated R star, and that's hard to know where you are. Well, it's easy to know where you are because the economy starts to tell you, Barkin, that's the problem. So Vanguard is right, and we see a push higher in yields. We're already seeing demand destruction at the commercial industrial banking level. We're seeing money destroyed in a debt-based economy. That's one of the worst things that can happen because in this case, the dollar is a global reserve currency. That means the demand for dollars goes up because there's fewer of them, the price of the dollar goes up, money from other parts of the world starts to flow into the U.S. economy, and then eventually into the U.S. Treasury securities, they start to drive rates down and force the Fed's hands in a big way, because you think about what creates dollars. Well, it's created by the commercial and industrial banks when they lend, and if they're not lending, we're not creating more dollars. Rates need to come down in a big way, and this is what the Fed can't see, and perhaps what Vanguard can't see is else is a net percentage of the bank's tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes. Now we're going to look at 10-year treasury yields against the federal fund rate. 10-year treasury yields in red, federal fund rate in green. And you see when banks start to tighten lending standards and they constrict the creation of credit, yields fall. And it makes sense. Again, in a debt-based market, you need new money to be created. So if the banks are saying, look, we're not going to allow for credit to happen, then rates need to fall to get people to demand the banks to lend. And what happens? The Fed starts to cut rates. You see that here again, going into the global financial crisis. Again, rates are starting to come down, saying the market is restrictive. The Fed then responds eventually by cutting. In fact, even going into the pandemic, we see the same notion. Banks start tightening a little bit. The market says, no, that's not a good idea. The Fed agrees with them. This time, the market tries to sell you. Look at the tenure. It says, hey, Fed, I think you've gone too far. And the Fed says, nope. And the market's like, oh, okay, you want to go higher. And then the market says, Fed, we think you went too far. Fed says, no, uh, we think we need to do more. And then the market says, well, okay, if that's what you want, we're coming back up here. But that doesn't mean we break that 5% level. What it means is the economy is massively restrictive. It's crushing demands, crushing lending. This is not a good sign for our economy at all. And when it comes to other longer-term consequences of the pandemic, Barkin argued that business owners may be more willing to raise their prices than they were before. But that's the problem. What if businesses can't raise prices? See, this is what the Fed doesn't understand. This is what I'm going to show you about that sector in the economy later in the show that's signaling there are danger signs ahead. Because if rates are too high and consumers can't borrow money, that means they can't go buy things. And if they can't buy things, well, that means businesses, they can raise their prices all they want but it means no one's going to come and shop and that's the thing the fed doesn't see and while i do hear price setters increasingly convinced that the era of significant pricing power is behind them which is true i'll show you that the inflationary experience of the last two years has surely given them more courage to use price as a lever and they love to raise prices but they can't anymore 
And the experience of having been cut short labor may also help explain the corporate reluctance to cut headcount, which is true, despite warnings of imminent recession for the last two years. And that, of course, maybe Barkin's watching our show here, that at some point, what we're going to see is that retailers and businesses can't keep a hold of people if they don't have sales. And sure enough, that's what we're seeing now as a consumer price index. It looks like it ticks up a little bit here, but look at advanced retail sales. And this is real retail sales adjusted for inflation. It's still almost negative, meaning that retailers are selling more in terms of a dollar amount, but inflation adjusted, they're not. So their expenses have gone up, but their sales aren't going up, up enough to cover it. That means at some point they have to cut hours, they have to cut heads, and they cannot continue to try to push prices higher because because if they do, it means people aren't buying. And there's a lot of evidence of that. Well, with one of the biggest automakers around, Tesla, as look at they're cutting US prices by 2000 as sales slow and inventory swell. And that's just exactly the point that the Fed can't see and that Vanguard doesn't understand is that yes, you can have higher rates, but it doesn't mean it leads to sales because if there was demand here, then Tesla wouldn't be seeing their inventories go up and they wouldn't have to be cutting their prices and here you can see they cut prices to their best-selling model y as well as the s and x by 2000 after disappointing first quarter sales contributed to swelling inventory that is not the sign of a robust economy in fact we noted that of course tesla is going to lay off people and that's exactly what happens this is what the fed doesn't see why they're so restrictive this is what vanguard doesn't understand you want to drive rates higher go ahead it's not going to lead to a good outcome in fact we're already seeing the signs that the u.s economy is pivoting to another turn down and the Fed goes on to say, as Barkin says, I'm open to the housing market coming down. As there are folks who've done models that suggest that with new rents coming down on the way they have, we're just minutes away from shelter inflation coming down as well. And that would be great. Of course, what he doesn't understand, he's going to crash the housing market because on net, when you see banks tightening lending standards here again, showing when that blue line is above that horizontal black line, well, housing starts to come down. But around 2000, there was such a demand for housing, it really didn't have have a huge impact but look what happened going into the global financial crisis housing starts started to fall banks started to tighten standards and they plunged and contracted in a big way here you can see the early signs of that happening and again and remember builders are sitting on massive amounts of inventory here just like tesla and guess what they have bigger margin than the resale market when they start cutting prices that puts downward pressure on resale that traps people in their houses that recently bought puts them in an upside down position you can see that how this thing unfolds because higher rates are not working here and the bond market has been trying to tell the fed hey look you need to cut you need to cut but everyone like vanguard keeps saying hey maybe everyone's going to sell here and drive rates higher and put us in the danger zone well maybe the problem is we're already in the danger zone and the issue when the Fed doesn't look like it's resolute on inflation, inflation doesn't come back to where it was before, as if the Fed has any control of this. If it comes to higher than it was before, which means that every time we fight it, you've got to take rates even higher, which means that damage you do to the economy is even more, even though the economy is already experiencing a high level of damage. It's just not showing up in the data quite yet. And so letting this expectation spiral out of control, I think it's just a very risky thing for the economy me indeed it is risky in fact the fed is very nervous about raising rates any further because they're afraid that they've already gone too far and if they push them up one more notch it could be what breaks the whole economy what they can't see is that we're already at that next inflection point we're already seeing the economy start to roll over and head down and one sector that's giving us that indication is the transportation sector and i want you to think about this why does transports as they tumble signal risk for the u.s equity market because if goods are not being transported or raw materials what does it tell you about demand it's coming down again the fed can't see this but here you can see as our concern is they're frequently case that the Dow transports weakness as a sign of broader economic weakness to come and it is that while there will be no such signs at present the firm this is from Evercore ISI does not for, or does forecast a mild recession to begin in the fourth quarter the reality is with rates being restrictive it's going to be far worse than mild it may start out as mild but it's going to get worse 
And how much worse for the equity market? Well, Evercore says the decline in the transport index is part of their thesis that the current correction in the S&P will not end before testing some 200-day moving average that currently stands around 4,600. That would be more than 7% decline from here. Again, setting up a huge opportunity for our subscribers. And if economic weakness becomes apparent, especially if inflation stays sticky, that correlation could go deeper and last longer as we made the case that a strong dollar could lead to a rise in volatility and an all-out unwind in the equity markets that would lead Vanguard's thesis that rates go higher. Well, that means they're going to come plunging lower in a big way. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.